so good to see you guys here today. And um, you guys know that we've been hit by a hurricane not that long ago. Yeah, some of you guys are still reeling from the, from the uh, repercussions. But uh, I don't know about you, but Sanibel is one of those islands that I like to go to the beaches, one of our favorite places. Do you know that Sanibel is like now open? The beaches have been open actually since from like February, but there's now pro public parking so we can actually go and enjoy the beaches over there. Does anybody else like to go to Santa Bells or just me? All right, yeah, good. Those are actually kind of our favorites, and so I'm super excited about this. And uh, But one of the beaches that is still closed, because there's like two of them where they're parking, what happened was when it flooded, it flooded the parking lots too, so they had to like shovel sand and all this stuff off of them. Lighthouse Beach is still not available. You guys know which one is Lighthouse Beach? That's the one when you're driving over the causeway and you look to the left, you see the lighthouse, of course, Lighthouse Beach. And when we first got to uh, this area, we would go to Sanibel, try it out the different beaches. And I got to be honest, Lighthouse Beach is not like one of my favorites. And I think it's because the, the water breaks on it because half the beach is wrapped around to the north side. And so it's kind of weird. And I like to go to Bowman's Beach. And so we would go quite often, especially in the summer. So I'm so looking forward to that because just a day at the beach with the kids is a lot of fun. And uh, as we would drive over, like every single time, my son, Woody, he loves Lighthouse Beach. And I think the only reason he loves it is because there's a lighthouse, right? So as we would drive over the causeway, he would always say to me, let's go to Lighthouse Beach. And we're all like, we're going to Bowman's, you know, but he's like, you know, he's young. And especially a couple years ago, like he's six now. So like when he was about three or four, he would go Lighthouse Beach and we'd say, no, we're not going to go to Lighthouse Beach. And he'd be like, no, but I want to go to Lighthouse Beach. So what we got in the habit of saying as we were driving over there is, I'm sorry, Woody, Lighthouse Beach is closed today. Yeah, I know. It's very <laughs> but it was so much better than the incessant Lighthouse Beach. You know how it is. Like, kids, are we there yet? Are we there? We'll live with are we there yet? Right? He will not let us let it go if we're driving over there and we're trying to say no because he's like a little lawyer. I've learned this about my son. And it's something that he'll say to you if you walk up to him and he starts saying to you, let me tell you something. He preempts the whole conversation. He preempts whatever the situation is so he can start lawyering you right away. Okay. So I'm like, I can't deal with this while we're driving over here every single time we go to Sanibel. So we kept saying, Lighthouse Beach, I'm sorry, Woody, it's closed, okay? So one time we're driving over there, and he says, let's go to Lighthouse Beach. Of course, we were going to go to Bowman, so I said, I'm sorry, Woody, <laughs> Lighthouse Beach is closed. And all of a sudden, he just breaks down crying, not again! He's like screaming and yelling, and I'm like, I see my son brokenhearted over Lighthouse Beach being closed, and I thought he would forget every time, like, this is not that big a deal, like, you just want it in a minute and it's be over, you know how kids are, they want something, but then five minutes later, they forget. I guess he'd been storing this up and remembering it, because he just breaks down crying, and I'm looking over him, and I'm like feeling brokenhearted for a minute, you know, parents, when you're just like, man, did I just do that to my child, you're thinking, right? And I'm like, oh, man. And I, so I said, all right, Woody, and the next time we went to Lighthouse Beach, okay? And it was just easier to tell Woody that Lighthouse Beach was closed than to, you know, get into the arguments. And so what we would do is just say this every time. We just got in the motion of it, right? We just kept going through the motion. Every single time, it just became the routine of the thing to say to him. And it worked out for a while, but eventually it didn't work for us anymore. And that kind of what happens when we go through life in some area of our life and we just kind of go through the motions. And, and have you ever been going through the motions in your life? And maybe you walked in here today and you're like, well, I feel a little bit like I'm going through the motions in some area of my life. But this probably happened to you. I'm sure we've all done it, right? You're working at your job and you're at your computer and you just decide to check Facebook or you got some kind of like little bing notification that goes up and you start looking at that and you're like, before you know it, you're there for like 15 minutes or more, right? And then the boss walks by, right? And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Yep, I'm going to order that right now. You know, you like start acting like you're doing something else in Facebook, right? You're like, okay, just go through the motions, not really ordering anything, right? Or pick up the phone call. Yes, okay, yeah, right? Because you don't want them to know like you were just doing something else. Or, or maybe perhaps I remember when I was in cross country, that's a sport when you're in uh, high school, and that's where you run like three miles all over the place and you try to win that race. Well, I remember one of the first races, and I really didn't want to finish the race, and so I faked an injury. That's right, I faked it, and I came limping in at the end. I was just kind of going through the motions. I'm like, I, I just didn't feel like running this race, and so I did that. And maybe you've done that too, or maybe you, you've gone through the motions uh, somewhere else. Sometimes it's in our marriage, right? We're kind of doing what we're supposed to do, but our heart's really not into it, right? And you might go through a season of that, or you might be in that right now. You're just going, yeah, I know, it's kind of 
kind of doing it, just kind of living. Or maybe you're going through a tough time, and so you've been going through some difficulties in your life, and you know everybody, especially when you come to church, how's it going? How you doing? Sometimes they add a brother or a sister to that. How you doing, brother? And you don't want to tell them everything that's going on, so you're just like, fine, everything's good, right? You're going through the motions, but you're not really, there's something else going on underneath. Or maybe you've kind of just checked out on life. You've been going, and you're just like, nothing's been working out for me. I'm kind of disappointed. My life doesn't seem where it's, where it's supposed to be. And we're just kind of checking the boxes. We're getting up. We're going to work. We're doing the things that we need to do, but we're just kind of going through the motions in our lives. And so for some of us, too, this can even, if you're a Christian and you know God, you could, sometimes it happens with God. It happens to all of us, right? You're just like, well, just not into it today. You ever feel that way? You're just like, I'm not into it. Don't feel like praying. Don't feel like reading my Bible. I'm not sure I want to even go to church. Let's just stay in there. It's Mother's Day. Let's just go to brunch, right? And sometimes we feel that way. We're just like, well, we go through the motions. But if you've ever gone through the motions before somewhere in your life, I bet you found this out. Going through the motions doesn't produce the results you're looking for, does it? You ever been in that desert? You go, well, if I keep doing the same thing, same thing, but it never changes my life. It never gets me to the place that I want it to be. Because we keep doing, just going through the motions. It's never satisfying. And it leaves you feeling that you're kind of missing out in some area of your life. And going through the motions, we realize, too, can only take us so far. I mean, we've all done it in some area of our life where we just kind of faked it for a while. But we realize just faking it is never going to take me where I need to be. And eventually, it just doesn't work anymore. But here's the good news today. There is a solution, and we're actually going to discover it today. And so you saw the little trailer, the bumper, and we're actually finishing a series, if you're new with us today, uh, on the book of Jonah. That's what it was all about, that little series of the fish and the the boat and everything like that. And it's the story of an Old Testament book. You can find Jonah. He tells kind of his story there. And this is the prophet that we've all heard that was swallowed by the fish, the big whale, right? And that's the guy. And today we're kind of in the final chapter, and we're going to learn something and discover something about what drives God. That's why it's called driven, because everybody's driven by something. I mean, God is motivated by something, and we're going to kind of discover that a little bit today. And because he is on a relentless pursuit of second chances. As we go through the book of Jonah, that's all you see. He's given Jonah second chances. He's given the Ninevites second chances. He keeps giving everybody second chances. And he continues to give us grace even when we don't deserve it. So if you're joining us for like the first time, you haven't been with us with the series, I'm going to kind of catch you up to the story with like a Cliff Notes version. So God calls his prophet Jonah. Jonah was a prophet who used to speak for God to other people. And he calls him and he says, now go to the Ninevites and preach to them. But Jonah doesn't want to go there. So instead he jumps on a boat and he heads in the opposite direction. And so while he's in that boat, God sends a big storm after him, so violent that it's threatening the lives of the people. They're unloading all the cargo. The ship's going to sink. And so in their dismay, the sailors are looking around. They find Jonah asleep at the bottom of the boat. They get him and discover that The reason this is happening is because Jonah is running from his God. And they're like, what do we do? And so Jonah says, well, you just got to throw me overboard, and then everything will become calm. They throw him overboard, and everything does become calm. But then God sends this giant fish to get Jonah because he's there floating in the middle of the ocean. And God's got to still the mission for Jonah, so he's going to take him back to where he needs to be. And that's what happens. He gets back to the beach, and he throws him up, okay? The fish just kind of pukes him up there on the beach. He gets up, dusts himself off, hopefully washed a little bit too, and then he heads all the way to Nineveh, and then he gets to Nineveh, and he preaches the worst message any preacher I've ever heard preach, okay? But he also creates the greatest revival that we know about in history, like 600,000 people decide to repent from the king all the way down to the cows, they start repenting by, by uh, wearing sackcloth and ashes and praying to God and crying out to him. And there's this great revival. And so the story would be awesome if it ended here, wouldn't it? I mean, we'd all be like, yeah, Jonah's like the best preacher I've ever seen throughout history. You know, we'd be giving high fives and fist bumps and everybody's rejoicing. And that's what you would expect. But that's not what happened. Someone is not rejoicing. In fact, we're going to pick it up right here in Jonah chapter 4. Listen to what he says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. That was Spain. That's what Bodhi took to get way away from there. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And then the Lord said, 
is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? I mean, Jonah here is mad. I knew this was going to happen, he says. He's upset that they actually responded to the message. That's why he didn't want to go in the first place. And that's why he, he teaches, all he says is like eight words. 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he says. He doesn't offer grace. He doesn't offer a solution. He just says, you guys are pretty much doomed and I'm out of here. Boom, right? And they all repent over this message. And so he's like, I, this isn't what I said to you, God. Isn't this what I told you when I was back in my country, that you were just going to be merciful to them and you're going to forgive these guys? This is what I, this is the very thing I was afraid of. And he's like thinking, you know, if we could just kind of continue the thought there. He's probably like, didn't, didn't, didn't you see all that these guys are doing? I mean, come on, really? Don't you know that they did? I mean, they kill women and children just for the fun of it. They have no respect for life when they would take over a country because the Assyrians at this time are the world power, if you will. And they're like dominating the world. But every time they went to a vi village or a city, they would just wipe it out. I mean, they would stack the skulls in a giant pyramid after they killed all of the military men so that no one would want to fight them and be like afraid of them. And they did this everywhere they went. And Jonah's like, God, haven't you seen all of that? And you want to forgive these guys? I knew this was going to happen. I knew you were gracious and merciful. It's interesting that Jonah here has kind of the correct theology. That theology means that we believe what God believes, right? We understand God. Like, he understands God at this point. He knows that God is loving and forgiving. How does Jonah know this, right? How does he know? I mean, isn't this the God of the Old Testament? I mean, isn't this the God, like, the first two, few thousand years, like, he, he has to have his coffee. He hasn't fully gotten up. It's like us before noon, you know, before 10 o'clock in the morning, right? It's like he's grumpy in the Old Testament. We all look at God in the Old Testament. We say, like, yeah, he was not merciful. He just wanted to judge people. And yet Jonah's in the Old Testament. And he's like, no, 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 no. I know that you're merciful, God. One, I mean, he experienced it himself. I mean, he runs away from God when God tells him to do something. And if it was me and I was God, I'm like, you want to run away? Fine. Lightning bolt, right? And just shoot him. But instead, he kind of goes after him. Like he bothers to chase after him and even send a fish to go get him. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't pleasant in the fish, but listen, you got back to the shore, right? And he's like, God sends something to go, for, go, to go after him. And you know, what's kind of interesting is that when Jonah says that to God, I know you are merciful. I know that you're slow to anger. He's actually quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting the book of Exodus when Moses brought him the Ten Commandments, all the judgment and all that stuff. I put it in, in the outline. It's up here on the screen. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sins. Like, I know this. We know all this, God. We know this about you. He knows God is gracious, but he doesn't agree with God on this one, does he? No, 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 God, I mean... The grace is for other people, but really, the Ninevites, it's not really for them. And at first glance, it seemed like Jonah was on the same page with God. At first glance, if we look at it, right? Because after he kind of comes out of the belly of the fish, he does go to Nineveh, and he does preach the message. But the problem is, his heart really isn't in it. And, and I've got a few fill-ins in your outline, and if you fill them in, I hope that this message will help stick a little bit better. So the first one is this, something that we can learn today, is that you can do all the right things and still not be in step with God if your heart's not in it right? We can do all the right stuff. We can like practice whatever it is, but if we don't, if our heart's not in it, we're still not going to be in step with God because even though we obeyed God, he's like, God, I just don't agree with you on what's going on here. You know, my son Woody, sometimes he just gets so mad. I mean, I, I am, I'm Italian and I can't blame it on my heritage, but I have a temper sometimes, okay? Somebody, a couple of you are like laughing if you know me, okay? So I, I have a temper and, and I'm trying to work on that temper in my life, but I notice it's in my son, and so when my son, we were sitting at the table, I distinctly remember he's sitting at the table and I told him, no, something like that, you can't do this, can't do that. I mean, I, it was gentle and nice, but I remember what he did, man, he just looked at me and he, like this. And he just bent his head silent and like just like staring straight. And I'm like, oh my God, here's this kid, he's got the temper, right? And even now, sometimes when I scold him, we put him in timeout, Woody will get mad at me. Like he directs his anger right at his dad, you know, his mom, he loves me, I don't know, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the punching bag. And he'll just stand in time out. Take a look at this. By the way, I didn't even tell him to face the wall. He just did that. But look at that face. Look at that face. I should have another one zooming in on that face. Look at those laser eyes. And you know he's looking at? That's me. That's where I'm sitting. He's looking at me like, Dad, you know, I love this picture in a sense because here he is complying, right? This is the epitome of I'm doing what I'm supposed to, but inside I'm not. 
<laughs> right? Inside, I'm rebelling. He's like, I'm going to be obedient. I'll do what you're telling me, but I'm not doing it on the inside. And it's kind of like Jonah in that moment. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go do what you told me to, God. But inside, inside, it's just not working for me, right? You know what you call that? We call that religion. That's where we go through the motion, but our hearts aren't in it. We're like, yeah, I'm just doing the thing. I'm like, you tell me to do X, Y, Z, I'll do X, Y, Z, God. You tell me that I shouldn't lie, steal, cheat, do those things, I'll do them, but my heart's really not in it, right? And some of them, they're easier, but there were certain ones that we go, yeah, 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 I'll do it, but just not there. You see, religion is when we do a lot of stuff for stuff's sake, but not because we mean it. And we've all done it in different areas of our life. Sometimes we just go on autopilot. We just keep doing it, but we're kind of like, oh, my heart's really not there. And so I can try to adjust Woody's behavior. And, and in some ways, it's working, right? Because I kind of force the behavior on him. You got to go to timeout or whatever. But you know what I can't do? I can't change his heart. I really can't. I can't change his heart. Do you think I want Woody in timeout or I want his heart? I, I, want, I don't want him in timeout. I want his heart. That's what I'm looking for. And that's where the problem lies, is that religion is, also, is never really a path to God. It's simply a path to rules. Because if we think God is only about the rules and we start doing it that way, we're going to end up not finding God. We're just going to find rules, a whole set of rules. And religion actually gets in the way of the relationship with God. Because we think that's what he wants when it's like me and my son. What I don't really want is just you obeying. I want your heart. Because if your heart's there, then you're already going to do the things that are pleasing. You see, religion can only take us so far because when you come to the point where you finally don't agree, that's when you're going to stop. That's what's happening with Jonah, right? I'm going to do everything he told me to do, God. But now I'm at a point where I'm now, I'm mad at you. I mean, he's having an argument with God, right? I'm like, God... I don't agree with what you just did because I did everything you said, but because my heart wasn't there, now I think it's kind of like we're having a problem here. See, he went along with the plan until it didn't work for him. He gets out of the fish. He goes to Nineveh. He completed the assignment. He was obedient until he disagreed with God. And see, that's when Jonah became angry. It said, we read it, it said it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. And so on the, I put on the screen here a couple words for you. Displeased is this is this Hebrew word yara, and it means so angry, you're trembling. Anybody been there? You're like, so, so angry, I don't even know what to do, right? You're clenching your fist. And angry, the same word in that sentence means burning hot. So there's Jonah, God, I can't believe you just did that. It's not like he just disagrees. He's like, that's it. I can't believe it. God, what were you up to? What are you thinking about? So he's so upset with God. He's like, how could you? Why are you giving them a second chance? The same thing that happens to Jonah is what's going to happen to you and me. When we find ourselves just going through the motions, no matter what it is, you're going to get frustrated at one point. At one point, you're like, it's just not working. And you'll find it's not going to work. And then you're going to come to the end of yourself. And then you're just going to stop. You'll be discontent. And sometimes we may even get angry with God. I'm going to raise my hand, but I don't expect you to. But has anyone been angry with God? Sometimes I'm like, God, what are you doing? God. I did what you wanted me to do. Why? What is going on? And so if we're only doing it because we're expecting something from God or like, hey, we got to toe the line, then at one point it's going to end, especially when things don't turn out like we expect. And what's the solution to this? What's the solution we get to this moment? What do we do? Well, the truth is we need a new heart. Jonah needs a new heart in that moment because I don't think all the reasoning at this point is going to change anything. He needs a change of heart. He needs a new heart. And the thing about a new heart is something that only God can provide. There's nothing we can do. And you probably have people that you pray for, people in your relationships that you know. And you're like, man, if they could just change this. And you're like, you know, they got it. They see it in one perspective. But you're like, if you could just change your heart. And if you tried to change their heart and you've explained to them until you're blue in the face why they should do X, Y, and Z for their life and they don't do it, you're like, I don't know how to change this person. And the truth is we can't change this person. Only God can change this person. But the good news is he wants to change them. Listen to this verse. It's from Ezekiel, Old Testament prophet. God's saying through him, and I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart so they will obey my decrees and regulations. Then they will truly be my people, speaking of Israel, and I will be their God. Notice what he's saying is like, it's not all the rules and regulations that are going to do it. 
It's the heart first, and then they'll truly be his people because the path to God isn't found through religion and rules. It's found through the relationship that you have with him. You see, God can do that in your life today. If you're thinking about like, oh, well, I, you know, there is some things that I, you're talking about and it's kind of resonating with me. I want you to know that God can do that today. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later because there's still a few more verses left to the story. So we're going to continue here. So Jonah, after he kind of complains to God, he goes out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade until he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head and deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah is like mad at God, comes out of the city, right? And now he's done preaching. I mean, it took him three days to preach to the whole city. So he had to walk through the whole city making this prayer, you know, preaching. But remember, he says in 40 days, yet 40 days, it'll be overturned. So now he's going to sit there and go, okay, maybe God still will destroy them, right? So he finds like vantage point, some box seat somewhere where he can look over the city and go, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait See if God actually destroys them instead, right? Maybe this repentance thing won't really work out, and maybe they'll just die, right? So he's sitting there, and he's hoping they'll be destroyed. And as he's waiting, God makes this plant grow. In the next verse, you can see it kind of comes in overnight, basically, and it goes the next day. And a lot of people, scholars believe it was called a castor plant, castor bean plant. Those actually grow very quickly in dry, arid places. I got a picture of one just for you. See this guy up on the top? So... It's big and leafy, and this thing will grow very quickly, and it survives in arid climates. But if you attack the, saw, the stalk of this plant, like if you damage it, it withers and dies pretty quickly. So maybe this is the, the plant, I don't know. God puts this plant up for him. But then it's kind of interesting. He makes a plant grow, but then he also brings out a worm. And he says, okay, he gets the worm to attack the plant so that the, the plant actually dies. And so now the sun, and he creates even a hot wind on Jonah, right? And Jonah's like burning under the hot wind. He's probably, his throat's dry. Sun's beating on his head. God created that for him to, for hap- to happen, and he's uncomfortable. He's angry about the Ninevites. He's angry with God. He's angry about the plant. He's so miserable. He's just like, I just want to die. I'm so sick of this. It didn't turn out, and I'm miserable, so why don't you just kill me, right? And, and if I'm watching this story unfold, maybe you're looking at it too, and you're thinking, God, you, sound a little, you seem a little schizophrenic here, right? You, you seem a little like you're flip-flopping. I mean, you're saving these guys, the Ninevites, and now Jonah's up there, and he's like, okay, well, I'll provide him a little bit of shade so he can watch, right? But then, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Now I'll provide a worm, and it kills the plant, right? And now I'm even going to put a hot wind on him. I'm like, God, what is it? You know, you save him. He goes on his journey. You save him with a fish. You do all these different things, but you're going back and forth, Right? He's doing this, though, for a reason, because he wants to reveal something about Jonah's heart. And that's the next thing in your fill-in is this. You can experience forgiveness and still not be forgiving if you're focused on worthiness. You can experience forgiveness and still not be forgiven if you're focused on worthiness. Jonah was upset that the plant is destroyed, but he's not upset at the idea that the Ninevites might be destroyed, right? It's like, okay, you're worried about this plant. But, like, these are a bunch of people over here. Like, this kind of doesn't make sense. But why is he upset about that? I mean, it's pretty obvious, in my opinion, if you read it. Like, he's mad because the plant was good to him, right? It's providing me shade. There's something that it's doing for me. It is somehow worthy because it's doing something good. But the Ninevites, man, they're wiping out all the people. They're, like, they're torturing people. They're they're not good. They're not worthy. So, like, I'm mad about the plant. He's like, "Are are you... Right to be mad about the plant, he says to Jonah. He's like, yeah, yeah, I am, right? Because it was a benefit to him. You see, in Jonah's eyes, one deserved judgment and one didn't. Man, I can't believe you just got rid of this plant. Like, that's not right. That thing was good. That was beneficial to me. The other people, they weren't, so we should probably just get rid of them. He's like, why are you destroying an innocent plant, but then you're not destroying these horrible people? At our house, we have something, uh, my, I hear my wife saying it all the time, we have something called the fair fairy I, don't, I think it comes from a, a book called Dog Man or something, but the fair fairy seems to arrive every time my kids start getting an argument over something like a toy, right? And here's what I always hear. 
That's not fair. That was mine. That's not fair. You did this. And you, if you've had kids and they come to you with the struggle that's going on, like, well, I hit her because she took my toy. Well, I only took my toy because you wouldn't talk to me. And then I don't know, did this, right? And you go back and forth. You never can get to the bottom of it, can you? I'm just convinced they're all evil. All kids are just evil. Because you're like, I'll never know who started this. And the fair fairy shows up. It's not fair, you did this. Yeah, but it's not fair, you did this, right? And we start comparing who's worthy or not. I'm like, the fair fairy doesn't know anything. The fair fairy can't decide this. And my wife starts saying that now. She goes, Charlotte, the fair fairy, you know, I hear the fair fairies here. Because it's like, when you start comparing, we'll never understand who's worthy and who's not. Because the truth is, we're all probably a little messed up. In fact, that's what Jesus said. He tells this kind of parable to the crowd. And he's trying to get this point across. I put it up on the outline. Look at this. It says, then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Okay, I'm deserving. You're not deserving is what was happening. It says, two men went to a temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank God that I'm not like the other people. They're cheaters and sinners and adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest with sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Go ahead, next. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be See, the Pharisee had a whole idea of what meant it to be deserving. Oh, sure, I've done a few things, but I haven't done these over here, so I'm pretty good and I deserve forgiveness. But that guy over there, the tax collector, that guy, no, he doesn't deserve it, right? He's comparing worthiness. I'm worthy of forgiveness. I'm worthy, more worthy than that guy who's sitting next to me in the synagogue. But that's not how it works. You might say, well, I don't do that. Well, well maybe we do. Let me, let me explain what I mean. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm driving down the road, the 20 feet in front of my car, the road, that belongs to me. Does anybody know that? So when I'm driving, that 20 feet belongs to me. Now, here's what happens. If I'm coming up onto a light or I'm trying to go somewhere and someone cuts into my road and cuts me off, that's not yours. That belongs to me. You didn't get my permission, Right? Especially if you're trying to get into some place and you're going and this guy almost causes an accident so you have to slam on your brakes. In that moment, what are you thinking? Where is a cop when you need one? Right? You're like, where is this cop? Why isn't he pulling him over? You, know, you, may, you might be someone who's a little bit more expressive and actually yell out the window, I don't do that, you know. I'll get too carried away. It's not that I'm above it. It's just I have to have some restraint, okay? <laughs> because I don't want to do something dumb. So I'm thinking inside, though, where's the cop? This guy needs a ticket. He needs to never do that again. I never want to see his face. You know, it's, I'm just all upset. But have you ever been driving down the road and you're kind of lost? You might be lost like you don't know where you're going or even lost in thought. You ever been doing that, thinking about that argument you just had with somebody? And you're like, oh, I don't know. And then you go, oh, wait, I got to turn right here, right? And you go, whoom, into that lane, Right? <laughs> And you hear the honk, you're looking in back, see if there's any police, please don't be a cop right now, please, I didn't mean to do that, right? And you're like looking, and if you're like me, you do the kind of the, the head down, arm up, kind of like, it's like, sorry, yes, I'm dumb, I didn't mean to, thank you for your grace and mercy. And they're like behind you, right? Isn't it interesting, you do the same thing as someone does to you, and you're like, well, yeah, but I didn't mean to, right? We judge ourselves, well, I, I want mercy, but for you, okay? It doesn't work that way, right? My sin on me looks like it needs to be forgiven, but my sin on someone else looks like it needs to be judged. And sometimes we can go through life because we're comparing who's worthy, who's not worthy, when God's just saying, okay, number one, none of you are worthy. None of you are. Jonah thought that he was more righteous than the Ninevites, so he's just running away, right? And he's running away and he, God had to come after him. He goes, I, I, God, all I did was run away from you, and you came back and got me, and then I did what you said. But these guys, they did so much worse. He's kind of comparing, like, I kind of deserve it, but to these guys, they weren't even looking for God. The Ninevites didn't even have them on their radar. It's kind of interesting, but James, he writes this, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. What? Wait a minute, what? 
If I just break one, then I'm guilty of breaking everything? Because, like, I'm not as bad as the other, those guys. Yeah, I didn't obey. I kind of broke your idea of do what you said. But these guys, they're, like, so much worse. And we start comparing who we are to somebody else. Like, is it, is there, are they worthy of grace? Are they worthy of forgiveness? And God says, look, you're all on equal ground because you break it in one area and you broke it in every area. How many sins does it take to separate you from God? That's it. That's it. And most of us, we've blown that already. All of us, we have. You see, forgiveness is not based on who is deserving or worthy. It's based on God's grace. Because God says, okay, yeah, I see all that, but you know what? I'm still going to choose to forgive you anyway. You Ninevites, I know what you're doing, but I'm still going to choose to forgive you anyway. You see, it's not our worthiness. Well, we're going to finish up here. So then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it's right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And, you, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city of which more than 120,000 persons who can't discern between right, their right hand and their left, and much livestock? Cares about the animals too, apparently, right? That's just where the book ends. Kaboom, stop. Like, okay, that's a little bit weird, right? God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah's response, yeah, even to death, God. He's still arguing with God. I think at any time that we're arguing with God, I, think it's, I don't think it's bad to argue with God, but anytime you're arguing with God, you got to understand you're not right, right? Like, I'm, okay, all right, I get it. It's taken a while to come around, but I, I, he, see, Jonah, he's blinded by his anger. I mean, he's so angry he can't even see straight. He's perspective has totally been blown. He's so focused on himself that he can't see a very obvious truth. And this is the last thing for us to learn today. You can have love and miss out on grace if you are focused on your own needs or if you're focused on yourself. You see, Jonah's focus on himself and on his perspective is so consuming that he can't see clearly. One of the reasons that Jonah is so angry is that he knows in about 50 years, the Assyrians who have been dominating the world are actually going to take out 10 of the northern tribes of Israel. There's 12 tribes. You got Judah and Benjamin down at the bottom. But in the north, they're going to come and they're going to take everybody away captive. You know why he knows this? Because there's two other prophets that live at the same time him, Amos and Hosea. And they're walking around preaching to all the Israelites saying, guys, you better repent. You got a problem here because Israel is backsliding. The people of Israel, they're worshiping other gods. They're practicing wicked practices within their land. They're not treating each other well. They're doing so much away from God and away from who God wants them to be that he's sending two prophets that are preaching to them saying, guys, you've got to change too. All this time, God's people have known God but have forsaken him. Think about this. That's their legacy. The people of Israel were to follow the God of the Bible. They were to follow him, but they're running away. See, God's argument to Jonah he says, is really kind of this. Are you angry about a plant? You're really angry over a plant that was here, that just showed up one day and then gone tomorrow? Where there is, but you have no mercy for these Assyrians? There's 120,000 of them implying there was a bunch of kids who didn't know their right hand from their left. They don't know God. They don't know anything. They're just innocent. And you're worried about a plant, but here's all these people. And there's animals too. There's livestock. But you're more concerned about a plant than all of these people. You see, somehow or other, somewhere along the line, Jonah lost this idea of mercy and grace for those around him. Like he's, the, he's the ambassador of God. He's there to show God's grace. He shows up and he's so disgusted, so mad. Hey, 40 days and you guys are going to be overthrown. He can't even preach a decent message. But God says, okay, I'll take that and I'll use it to save so many people. You see, these people have never had a prophet, never had somebody come to them. And yet, <clears throat> excuse me, the kind, the Israelite for thousands of years have experienced God. There were kings that God gave them. There were prophets that gave them. They saw miracles. They saw preachers, all these things that the Israelites saw. And they still turned and worshiped other gods. He's like, look at, they don't even know anything. And yet I, you, you know, I'm going to save them. They're going to turn at one preaching and you guys keep turning your backs Forever, you keep walking away from me. You see, they turned at the preaching of one prophet in Nineveh. And then Matthew, he writes this. He says, and then he added, 
go and learn the meaning of this scripture. Almost as if he's speaking, almost as if he's speaking to Jonah. I want to show, I want you to show mercy and not offer sacrifices, for I have come to call those who think they are righteous, not those who think they are called righteous, but those who know they are sinners. If we only have a heart that focuses on self, we're going to miss out on grace. Because God's got grace for each and every one of us. He wants to save everyone. Jonah knows that his heart is not in it, right? Jonah ends his final statement of God. This is how it ends. It's just left open-ended. We're not even sure what really happens. But Jonah's writing this book, so I kind of get the feeling that he finally gets it at one point, right? He finally understands because he leaves it us hanging right there. But if you left it right there, Jonah would be in a pretty miserable place, wouldn't he be? Sitting on that hill, looking down, sun beating on him, not turning out the way he wanted because he's just going through the motions. You know, today, if you walked in here and you're just going through the motions, you're probably discovering what we talked about at the very beginning is that it's not working out. It's just not working out for us. And if we really want to experience something different in our lives, then what we really need is a heart change. And maybe you walked in here today and you're like, yeah, I've been in this marriage right now and I'm like, um, I've been going through the motions for quite some time. You know, the love is gone. And we've probably heard everybody say that, somebody that we've known at some point, right? I just don't love them anymore. It's not there. So we're kind of hanging on. We're just going through the motions. And nothing's changing and we're not happy. Just like Jonah, we're just kind of miserable. Maybe you're like kind of giving up on life. God, you didn't show up when I thought you were going to show up. I mean, I expected to be here by now or I expected you to do this. And so we're still trudging along and we're just kind of going through the motions, but we're kind of our heart's not in it. We just kind of like, okay, don't know where to go from here, but I guess I just keep moving forward. Maybe it's something else, it's your kids or family, or maybe it's your job. This isn't the job that I wanted. I, this is my business, didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to be, God. And so we just keep going through the motions. And God's here to say, listen, I love you. And I've got so much better for you. But I, you got to let me in and you got to let me change your heart. And most of us know that. In fact, sometimes we may have even cried out, God, help me to love this person. Help me to find that joy. Help me to get over this thing that happened to me so long ago. Sometimes we hold on to the wrong thing. You know, emotion can be a powerful thing. Because somehow emotion feels, uh, makes us feel alive, even if it's the wrong emotion. You ever notice that? I'm going to hold on to that anger. I'm going to hold on to that bitterness. I'm going to hold on to whatever it is. And so we're holding on to these things and going through the motions and we're still upset and we can't understand why. Because God's like, you just got to release it. You got to let it go. Jonah, if you could just see things the way I see things, you could be rejoicing with me right now of the greatest revival that's ever taken place. You know, there's kind of a thing that, I don't know if Jonah really realizes this. He knows that God is going to use Assyria as the instrument to kind of discipline Israel because they're not following God. So he's going to allow this nation to come in and take them away so that they'll wake them up and see God again. And what I don't think he understands is you're going there so that they'll change their habits. Maybe God's grace was for Israel too. So that when they invade you, they don't just wipe you out like, they're, they're, like they've been doing. That they might show you a little mercy when they take over. And that they don't destroy you. And they don't humiliate you. And they don't do all this stuff to you. Because God is the God of grace and the God of second chances. He gives Jonah a second chance. He gives the Ninevites a second chance. This is the God of the Old Testament. And he wants to give every single one of you a second chance. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever desert you're walking in, whatever hill you're sitting on waiting for something to happen and it's not happening, God's just saying, if you could just change your heart, even your situation might look different to you than it does right now. So what I want to do is this. I want to close, but I want to offer you guys an opportunity to just change your heart. And we're going to do that in two ways because some of us are Christians and we've been kind of going through the motions. We're checking the boxes. Yeah, I read my Bible, I pray, I come to church, but you know, I'm just not into it. Well, maybe for us, we can say, God, can you transform my heart? Because he has the power to do it. And for some of us here also, we've never given our lives to God. 
We've never given him that heart. We've never invited him in because we've been Jonah. We've decided we're going to do it our way and continue to do it our way. When the Jewish people celebrate Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, where they sacrifice an animal for the whole sins of the people, they have this ritual where they say, I am Jonah. I am Jonah. And at one point, we have to recognize, I'm Jonah too. Listen, God has so much more for you. So much more than the routine. So much more than going through the motions. He wants you to have an abundant life. And I hope that message is clear to you today. So we're going to do two things. I'm going to close in prayer for everyone who right now just says, I need to change your heart. And then for those who've never invited Jesus in, I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to invite you to pray it so that your life can be changed forever. And what that means is when God comes into your heart, he transforms it. You see, we were born apart from God. God knew us. God created us. But we weren't in sync with him because we kept sinning and that divided us. But God can change that for you. We can't change it ourselves. I can never make up for those things. But God comes and dies on a cross. He comes in the form of Jesus Christ, dies on a cross so he can die for the whole creation. And when he died, he lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't. And what happens is when you invite him inside, an exchange takes place that God does. He takes our righteousness and he throws it out. You're like, I'm not worthy. You're right, you're not worthy. We're not, none of us are. And he says that, but I'm gonna get rid of it and I'm gonna give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When I look at you now, you're worthy because I see my son's righteousness in you. And that's the prayer. And that's what's going to happen when you invite him inside. So let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, I know there are people here hearing my voice. That, Lord, we've been wandering a little bit. We've been going through the motions. We've been kind of making it work, but we're not happy inside. God, we're looking for something, and maybe we didn't know what it is, but, I, but we know it now. We need you to change our hearts. Lord, I know how many times I tried to change my own heart and I just couldn't. I kept failing. But you can do it. We can change our act actions. We can change the motions that we're going through, but nothing will truly change us except that heart change. So God, come inside us right now. God, and change our heart. Change my attitude, Lord. Change my perspective. God, change my unforgiving heart. Release that pain, God. Help me give you my anger. Help me give you my... My negativity, God, help me to give you all the things that I just am sick of carrying. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to go through the motions. God, I want your freedom. I want your spirit inside of me. God, we invite your spirit to come inside of us and change us from within. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. And now if you're out here and you've never prayed to receive Jesus before, I just want to lead you in some words. It's your, just helping you articulate asking God to come in and save you and transform you. And so if that's you, we're going to pray this out loud. Let's all pray together. Dear God, I invite you inside to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. Forgive me of my sins, of all I've done wrong. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus, from this day forever. I'm yours and you're mine. I'm not going through the motions anymore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.